everyone. Welcome back to the Marcus Talker channel. Now, this is a very special live stream um, of my series Drink with Traders. And now today I have the one and only John Hoagland from Top Step with me. John, great to have you here. It's great to be here, Dee. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Good to see you as well. Uh, what are you drinking? Because I know it's a bit early, but you know. Coffee. Same. So it's going to be boring. <laughs> I've tried it before. I have drinking and traded. Usually not a good idea. I agree. Yes. I tried that once, which was uh, like an afternoon session in London. Somebody brought out some beers and the markets were still open. Yeah, it, it wasn't my best day. It wasn't a disaster, but it wasn't my best day. <laughs> Yeah. What were those inhibitions, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no fear. Liquid courage. Yeah. Okay. We've got Murph here uh, saying, I'm drinking tea. Okay. That's nice. <laughs> it is about tea All time, right. isn't it? Hmm? What's that? I guess it's tea time here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very early where you're at. So it's what, 11? Yeah. Yeah. 11 o'clock. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's 5 p.m. here. So, I mean, I could justify having a drink, but it's Wednesday. So, you know. <laughs> you know, any day that ends with why. Yes, that's right. Okay, so now, John, usually we're used to seeing you telling us about the markets or you're interviewing traders, you're doing the coaching. Uh, but I wanted to kind of flip that around and to sit down with you to, uh, to actually find, find out things about your life for a change. <laughs> That's yes, our, putting you on the spot. <laughs> For a change, yeah. Um, so we met uh, when I got funded by Top Step some years ago. And uh, back then you guys had this like private messaging service and you were my risk manager. And we actually mm -hmm. chatted quite a lot through that little system. That's how we got to know each other. Um, yeah. Now, I know that everybody knows you as a trader. And I know you put on your Twitter that you're a guitar player as well, but most people don't really know much about your musician career. So why don't we talk about that, going back to your music roots? Well, um, yeah, I actually started as a, as a drummer. I had a brother that was eight years older than me. And so, you know, I'm in grade school. He's in high school. He's got a rock band. He was a guitarist. So they were always practicing in our basement. And I, got, I just became fascinated with the drums. So I started in first grade with snare drums and the band and everything. Got my first set in third grade and played drums, you know, all the way into my, really into my 40s until I got tired of carrying them around. Um, but I was always, you know, fascinated with, with the guitar as well. And so I started learning things from the, from the guitarists that I was working with in all these bands. And what, what happens then is you learn the beginnings of a million songs. Like, you know, I could do the beginning of Stairway to Heaven or I could do the beginning of Smoke on the Water. Um, and just, to, you know, I decided when things got a little bit more serious with the bands that I'd be a better drummer if I understood what guitarists wanted from a drummer. So I, um, I got a, a teacher. He's a great teacher, Rob Curtis. He's a master's degree in classical guitar. And I was really interested in getting good, good, good technique. And I was really interested in finger style. So this was perfect. Um, and that really kind of dug into me for, for a very long time. Um, and once I kind of ended a band that I was with playing drums and playing a lot of guitar and I, I actually learned to sing a little bit. So I did some kind of solo acoustic uh, vocal stuff from just bars around here. Um, and I haven't really been playing that much lately. My pads are getting a little soft. I got to get back to it. But you know, I was, um, I've always felt as though I was a creative person um, and, uh, and uh, you know, just kind of needed to, to do that. And, and uh, I'm going to so, get back to it. Too. So the creativity side, do you think that helped you as a trader or hindered you? Well, I think it helped, uh, especially as a discretionary trader. And, you know, there are those, there are those that are always going to argue that, you know, if it's not an, if this, then that type situation or automated, it's no good. Um, but I think that, uh, the ability to create intuition through knowledge and experience in trading has at the very least helped me stay out of a lot of really bad situations just to, just to say, you know, this, this doesn't, doesn't pass the smell test. We're not we're not going to do this, and I think it saved a lot. 
because you know the things sometimes you're in a trade and something changes and yeah it happened to, to me, me last night actually i was in a mm -hmm. trade the whole russia thing came in and and to be honest right. it did throw me off completely and i tried like a couple of things and my my mind was just like ah oh, no okay and and i just decided to stop and <laughs> give up um yeah. sometimes that's how you what you have to do and to be honest with uh, with music you're in that kind of high pressure situation especially if you're ad-libbing a lot there's not mm -hmm. a lot of time to think what you're going to do, whether you're going to do this. Like you have to be pretty confident in your own skills and then just to kind of go with the flow almost. And I think mm -hmm. that that's something that's helped me in my trading as well, having the flexibility to change your mind under yeah. high stressful situations. Yes, yeah. to be creative, to, to accept information that's contrary to what you might think. Yes, awesome. Um, so I take it to you, uh, you, don't, you don't play much anymore. You said your pads are getting soft. Yeah, I haven't been very much um, lately, and, and I don't know why. It's like I could not, you know, you're learning to play an instrument and you're really into it. You, you'd pick up the guitar, you'd play for 10 minutes and get mad at it, and you'd put it down, and five minutes later, you're back picking it up. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, for years it well, that's how it was. I mean, I played every day, and I was always learning new pieces and learning new things, and and it just kind of stopped one day, uh, or was for a period of time, and I haven't been able to kind of reignite that. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I'm thinking about buying a new guitar. Oh yes, new and gear then, always uh, gets the spark going. <laughs> right, right. Get a new computer. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, new yeah. toys new toys always good yes nice <laughs> all right so uh let's go dive into your trading background uh your father was a trader if i remember mm -hmm. correctly so how yeah. much influence did, did did he have if any on you starting to trade well <clears throat> my dad uh had a tremendous amount of influence as a matter of fact uh you know i went to art school um and got a got a job on the floor of the mercantile exchange now he was at the board of trade mm -hmm. i had to go to the mercantile exchange because of course i have to make my own way right well after you know a, a few weeks on the trading floor it, it just something about it got me because i was always under the impression that it was always you know that it was always about money and 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 I didn't understand I don't think really what he did and how actively creative it really was um mm. so after a while in art school I said you know what I'm not going to I, I don't really feel like starving for my art so this trading thing you know this this you know this mercantile exchange really has a lot of good opportunities uh so that's what I did. I stayed there and worked my way up and, and uh, eventually got hired as a proprietary trader and funded my own account and was a broker for a number of, for a lot of years. And, uh, and I don't regret it <clears throat> because I think, you know, along with music and raising a family and everything like that, it's, uh, it has been, it's continued to be a, an opportunity to continue to exercise creativity. I agree. I totally agree. I had a similar, um, similar thought um, when I was first learning how to trade. Um, the music industry at the time was kind of going through a, a bit of a credit crunch, post-credit crunch problem. Uh, the quality of the gigs that we were doing were declining rapidly. And, you know, I wasn't new to that world. You know, I had probably about a good sort of 12, 13 years experience of being a musician so I knew what it was like and then suddenly I noticed my fees were going down and I was getting a bit older as well you know you don't you're no longer 19 you don't have boundless energy to just not sleep and keep traveling the world and it just got tough 
it just got tough. Well, and with the money going down, it, it's obviously something that affects your livelihood, right? So you had you had a family. I only had a dog and my boyfriend <laughs> at the time. And I was like, you know, I still I would still like security as I age and not, like you said, starve for my art. That was never on the cards for me. I used to love mm -hmm. music. I've been a musician since I was four years old. But at and some point... Multi-instrumental. Multi -inst yes. yeah. A lot of your you are you got a lot further in the industry than yeah. i ever even dreamed of well i actually had to start twice because obviously i started in in serbia in yugoslavia when i was like 14 which was in the 90s and then i got pretty far over there some would argue that i got to the very top of that that um, industry and there was just nowhere for me to go but then i changed countries because I don't know how many uh, viewers know this, but I'm from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia fell apart during the 90s due to civil wars, which weren't pretty. But obviously, um, that meant that I kind of made some decisions that were actually pretty good for me in the long run. And one of those decisions was to move to London. London was always close to my heart because my sister was born there. My parents used to live here. Everybody was, uh, you know, always kind of talking about London. We were coming to London and it was just like a logical place for me to move to. And uh, it was great because, <laughs> first of all, I got to experience for the first time what it's like to be by myself, which wasn't easy. But in a way, it was strangely liberating because my dad was actually really famous over there. So wherever I went, I couldn't get away from him. And I, I suspect it was probably similar with your dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like wherever yeah. you look there he is <laughs> yeah well he's right there yeah. actually oh there's, that's uh, nice it, that's his nice. uh is a navy picture from from uh um veterans day but uh mm -hmm. yeah he was um uh, you know as a as a teenager growing up trying to make my own way before you know i did the same thing i mean i, I grew up in the suburbs of chicago i moved to to, to the city in a, in a little apartment and was working at the Merck and got a job as a bartender just to make sure ends were ends were meeting. And, you know, at 18, when you know everything, my dad said, you know what, uh, one of these days you're going to realize I'm the best friend you got. And I was about 21 when I called him and I said, do you remember when you said that? And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. I learned so much from him in that period of time. And it's kind of amazing. People say that they, Teenagers are amazed about how much their their parents learn in the two years after they turn 18, right? <laughs> yeah, we're going through something like that with my two nieces. They're no longer teenagers, but it's almost like they're a little bit late to the party. They're 22 and 23. Uh, but yeah, they're still behaving as if they're, they're they know everything their way or, or no way. Yeah, yeah, they know everything. <laughs> quite a, quite a thing. One of them was born older. She just seemed to know. And, you know, the other one is still fighting. So <laughs> Nice. Right. So you started in the open outcry pit. So that was quite different. What, what was that like? It was, um, it, well, the S&P pit was a big, nasty, you know, full pit. It was, it was like very physical uh you know of course very very mental and emotional and uh, um there was nothing like it in the world i can tell you that and there, there never will be you know the trading on the floor and the trading pits was was a uh, an era that is now bygone but i'm glad that i was able to be part of it uh you know you you couldn't just say i want to buy it and press it and press a button you had to vocalize it and use hand signals to tell everybody that you you know they couldn't hear you what you were trying to buy how many you wanted to pay for what or how many you wanted to sell at what price so it you know six hours and 45 minutes i don't think i could do it now i think i'm too old but um it was everything they say it was the last bastion of true capitalism 
Yeah, we had uh, uh, one of the, the, the other guys, uh, James Thorpe, he, he was a pit trader as well. And he said his wife was a bun trader. And that was like 300 people in the pit. So she's, he said that she was actually really glad that that whole thing ended because there were like people spitting in her hair. <laughs> so showing oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah you're, you're chest to back, shoulder to shoulder with people who's screaming and hollering and gas and all kinds of things going on. It was, I don't know how women dealt with it, but you know, a lot of them did. They, they, they stuck it out. But I wonder if your friend uh, knows a friend of mine that was in the bun pit, uh, Peter Regis. I don't know. I can ask him. I can ask him. Yeah, he yeah. actually he's he lives somewhere outside of Chicago as well now, but he's from the UK originally. Yeah, his wow. wife his his wife is I think a Chicagoan, and then they they met. I don't know exactly when. I think quite a long time ago, and they married, mm-hmm. and then they went back there because her family was still around your ends. So yeah, so maybe it, it's a it's probably quite a small world. So I would guess that they probably do know each other. Again, I can yeah. ask him. He now we actually have a. Yep. Go ahead. No, 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 we have a we have actually a question that that kind of pertains to this whole thing. Um, I was going to ask you that as well. So, uh, do you think trading electronically now is easier or more difficult than trading in the pit? I think it's more difficult because trading in the pit, we could see our our competitors. We could see what the banks were doing what the what the big firms were doing you know you could you could stand in the middle of the s p pit and watch two thousand contract buy orders go around the pit merrill shearson uh bay shy corp you'd watch you just see these these orders coming in and it, it allowed us the opportunity to recognize when our direct competitors the the other short time frame traders in the pit were getting too long or too short if you had paper coming in buying all day long, you knew that the, the short time frame the pit traders, the, the, the pit was going to be short. And if you caught it at the right time, they would all turn and flatten out and you could catch that move. So it's a, it's more difficult. I think it's a much more even playing field, if you will, because nobody gets to see who's doing what actually, you know. So it was one of the things that I had to kind of get into my head after leaving the pit to go trade on screen was I wasn't going to have that advantage anymore. I wasn't going to be able to physically see what the major banks, what the funds, what, you know, what the big players were doing in the pit because everything had to be done in the pit. So you could see it. Now it's much more difficult. So uh, that kind of also answers another question. Uh, Is it completely different or were there any parallels? So it's, it's very different. Yeah. Well, the one thing that uh the first thing my dad ever taught me about trading was the market profile he was actually an acquaintance of pete stylemeyer and my dad used to go yeah right so right back to the beginning so so for the viewers who don't know peter stylemeyer is the guy that came up with profile so Mm -hmm. um like jim dalton kind of popularized it but peter was the 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 guy that came up with it so that's Mm -hmm. remarkable yeah, he was looking for just a different way to organize the market's information and uh, came up with the, the bell curve theory and, you know, um, assuming acceptance through time instead of volume or momentum. Um, but he he showed me, you know, I, I think I'm in like seventh or eighth grade at this time. He says, there's a guy in the trading floor that's got this new way of looking at markets. Why don't you sit down and let's talk about it? I was like, I'm, I thanks, Dad, but I'm I'm gonna go skateboarding. I'm not even gonna. It, yeah, it, very it, interesting. It, I'll be, I'll get back to you. <laughs> right, okay. have your guy call my guy. Uh, so it wasn't until I started trading as a, as a prop trader, and he never really brought it up again. Um, I'm surprised he didn't, but it was a friend of mine that uh, that uh, handed me mind over uh, mind over markets um, shortly after it was written, and he says. Take this home, read the first hundred pages, bring this one back to me tomorrow, and then get your own copy. You still have a copy signed by the by Dalton. But you know, that's it's the one constant I can say that I took from pit trading that I've taken into screen trading. Hmm. Right. Interesting. Um, 
somebody wants to know something about supply and demand. I don't, I, I, I'm pretty sure you, you didn't really hear about the supply and demand concept. You heard it from me because I remember that you were asking me about it because that was my way of trading. And then mm -hmm. I started to kind of marry that throughout the years. I married that with the profile. So somebody right. is like, oh, please add something. Well, you know, supply and demand back in those days, I, I can imagine you were talking about seeing the orders. So that would be your version of supply and demand. You could see where the sellers are, where the buyers are, and how many mm -hmm. contracts are being bought or sold, right? Mm -hmm. So that will be the supply and demand. Yeah. All right. So uh, and it's just a different different word for different name for yeah. you know, kind of consolidation to consolidation, supply yeah. and demand. Right? Yeah. And also where the big buyers and sellers are. That's that's effectively what we're looking for. And no matter what kind of order flow strategy people use, uh, mm -hmm. that's what we all want to see. Obviously, different time frames come into the whole picture. Uh, but ultimately, we are looking for the relevant players in the market that, that leave their mark. So whether mm -hmm. you're looking at profile, supply and demand, however you want to call it, footprint charts, you know, whatever the, you know, inventions right. they've got now, that's all the same thing. It's just a slightly different way of coming up with, uh, with a, like you said, a more organized way of, to, of looking at the price, um, irrelevant to the volume, but rather using time. Time is actually a huge component in what I do. Huge component. I don't know how I trade without it. <laughs> and right. I don't think I will ever move away from that concept. No, that was very transformative for me. And I can imagine whoever gets a hold of that, that concept is the same. It's very eye opening. I like the way you put that. Uh, see who's leaving a, put, leaving a mark on the market. Just don't want it to leave a mark on me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's a guy asking whether the pits closed solely because of COVID. No, Ryan, I mean, I'm going to let Hog answer this, but the pits actually started closing a long time ago. John, why don't you answer? Yeah, I think by the time COVID hit, I, there was, I think there was um, one futures pit. That was the S&P pit. And there were just a few people, I think, still coming in there every day. Where they really ran into problems was the Euro options pit. The Euro options was... Uh, you know, such there's so many different strategies. They were still, I guess, working on developing these strategies for computers. That's where I think they had a they had a real problem. And I do, I mean, I haven't seen anybody or talked to anybody. I'm pretty sure they did kind of close it down for a while, and then they 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 made everybody stand further apart and wear masks and. Yeah, there was, there was a London Metal Exchange that was still uh, operating even when I first started trading. And then that closed for a while. And then it reopened, like sort of in 2015, I think. And I was like, that's weird. Why are they reopening an LME pit? And it was a weird one because I went in there just to see what it's like. I wasn't actually trading in there because it's a very long recruitment process. And I kind of didn't want to go there. I was already deep in the prop world. <laughs> And uh, I went in there and I kind of expected that loud atmosphere, everyone shoving each other and everything. And it was so civilized and like miles away from anything that I imagined. It was like people in a circle and all in, like wearing red jackets, about nine of them, maybe eight or nine of them. A couple of them were women as well. And they were just sitting down. They weren't even standing up. And they were just like, It was almost like there's just agreeing on the price. There's no buying and selling. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And I think now that's that's gone as well. So um, pits closing had nothing to do uh, with the COVID. It actually had everything to do with the move to electronic trading. So the interest right. naturally just waned. Which actually um, started uh, in the mid-1800s with the creation of the ticker tape. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So and do you use? Actually, it was yeah. actually yesterday that the first ticker tape was was used. Right, uh, I think it was like eighteen fifty something. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so um, actually, this is quite a good question. Um, when you were trading in the pit, how long did your trades last? Because it was all intraday, obviously. But on average, how long were you in a trade for? Uh, it started as. A scalper work the bid work the offer you so you buy the bid you try and sell the offer you can't sell the offer hit the bed go back <laughs> rinse and repeat 200 times a day 400 times a day whatever it is that was the true scalper i mean that's really what the hft's algos that's that's their role now and if you're trying to compete with them you've got a lot of competition well, but over time 
Yeah, you, do, you, you don't even have the servers to compete for that. Yeah. Like a human couldn't possibly uh, create mm -hmm. anything that's even close to that because you're not fast. And second of all, the amount of money that it would take you to actually have a server like that, it, it goes into like about a million a year just for maintenance of the systems. So right, people need right. to be a little bit realistic. Why even go down that route? HT is like not something we do. And it's not necessary oh. to be a profitable trader these days anyways. Right. If you, if, as long as you don't compete in their time frame, you're going to be okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what was what were we talking about? <laughs> I <got lost. laughs> oh, um, uh, yeah. When I learned, when I started looking at the profiles and started re recognizing better trade locations and the ability to limit risk in a longer time frame, my trades went, you know, from uh, seconds to, to minutes to minutes to half an hour to 40 minutes, 45 minutes, sometimes even longer. One of the trades, I mean, I got short at noon and I got out MOC. So that we're talking about three and a half hours, three, three and a quarter hours on, in that. So. And were they trending yeah. moves typically? Were know. they something that went on a run and you stick with stuck with it or? Uh, what my goal was really to, to, um, to work a position, you know, if I was short and the market was going lower, I try and buy a down tick and then try and, you know, let, let it back out at a higher level. Now, if I just used part of my package, whatever it was, um, you know, I used to like to, if I, if I believe the market was going to like, for example, trend lower the entire day, I'd get short, get, make sure it was in the money. And then I would take that trading card I take that trading card and stick it in my pocket and forget about it. And a clerk that would keep track of my position. And then, you know, I eventually had to turn around and say, Hey, you know, um, nine, even work a one lot stop for me, nine, even nine, even on one stop for me to tell a broker about it and then forget about it. And they have to worry about it. So I got the short in my pocket. Now I'm working, doing trading throughout the day. And I have this short that I, my clerk doesn't know about, so he's not putting it in my account. It's in my pocket, but you know, within a few minutes, I'm probably going to forget about it anyway. Uh, and then, you know, I've had it where the two o'clock that afternoon, the broker is going, "Hey, you still want me to work that stop for you?" I'm like, "Oh no, you, you know, here, go market, <laughs> go market." <laughs> so he just buy it for me and throw me the card. So you know, if it if it worked out great, if it didn't, I had to stop. I knew I was protected with the, by the broker who was working the order, and I could you know operate normally throughout the day, whatever normal was. So let's talk about some defining moments in your mindset, career, because for me, every time I experienced a really big day or a losing day, a bigger losing day, it kind of had an aftermath effect on my mindset, which sort of pushed me to either get better or to kind of censor myself a little bit. So let's talk about... Um, some of your biggest wins and losses and how they affected you. Because obviously the purpose of these interviews that I'm doing is to, to give aspiring traders an idea of what it really takes to sustain a career and how, you know, how many rites of passage we have to go through in order to get better. So talk to me, um, which, uh, did you have any kind of massive winning days and massive maybe one lost day that really kind of put you in your, in your place and went, woo? my the biggest winning day was probably my my first like more than five figure winning day um was well you, first you start trading one lots so you get used to trading mm -hmm. one lots then maybe you move to two lots or three lots or you know move your way up that way <clears throat> and i was a one lot trader and a broker looks at me and says hey saw you five and then looks away so now I'm now I just bought five and I am literally shaking because I had never had anything more than a one lot on. That's five times the normal risk, and these are big S and P's. Luckily, the market went my way, and there were a couple locals that said, "Hey, I'll take a couple." Okay, two, two, and then finally I had to calm down and write everything down. Ended up being a good trade, but you know that's the kind of um, one of the one of the the processions or whatever that you have to go through is you you don't start trading fives and tens you start trading ones and twos and work your way up to it because you don't know how that risk is going to cause your decision making to 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 change I, I mean I could have absolutely frozen there um, but 
as I was learning the profile um, and, you know, staying in the pit, like literally almost from, from bell to bell, there was a day that uh, the market was kind of range bound and it was like, it was like noon and all the, all the big traders that were on the top step had gone to lunch. So I'm up at the top step and standing right in front of a broker and, I know we're like at the high of the range, so I'm thinking, all right, if this is, if I'm going to trade profile and I think this is going to hold, I got to try and get short up here above value. So the broker says, um, you know, hey, he's half on half on one. I say one at seventy. He says take it. So I sell him one at seventy. He goes half on two. I go two at seventy. He says take them. So I end up accumulating five contracts. Now I'm trying to expand my time frame to stay in the trades at this time. And the market never went against me. I mean, it didn't barrel my direction, but it was always in the money. So I stood there. And it seemed like weeks, you know, when you have risk on time slows. Yeah, everything seems so much more uh, uh, amplified is the word. Yeah. And, and so the market's you know, the creeping my way, creeping my way. I'm standing there like this they're trying to talk to me I'm like, rawr, rawr, rawr. <laughs> and it starts it's kind of accelerating now it's like one o'clock 1 30. now it's taking out the lows and I'm short five at the highs so I, I buy two when it, is, it takes out the lows I buy one more a little bit lower and I and I tell the broker buy me two MOC and I leave because I don't want to cover these two contracts well, it turns out the you know the, the close is pretty much the low of the day. It was about forty five thousand dollars that day. It scared the living bejesus out of me to make that kind of money in one day. So I took the next two days off, probably because I was hungover. But I think it was a good thing to do because we all know when you have a really big day, the day after you're at risk. Yeah, interesting you say that because, like I said, the James Thorpe, the guy that I interviewed, he said that uh, he had a really big day, and then uh, pretty much the next the day got drunk. They went down the pub, and he was like, "The market's gonna puke tomorrow. There's no way this is going there." And then he actually had a really big loss the, the very next day. So it's funny mm -hmm. that you say that you you took two days off, and it sort of kept you from from almost digesting what's happened without actually having any risk on it's a it's a very good coping strategy as well guys so i just want to say to our viewers so if you have had a really big day we've seen people in our industry who do one massive day and then they come into the next day and they lose it all and then some and why it's because of the overconfidence you know you you think you can do no wrong now and that's never yeah. true <laughs> No. If you've had a no. huge day, maybe take a step back and come back in 48 hours. I would even say leave it for that week and then come back Never. fresh the next week. You lose your humility, danger is at your mm. door. And it's easy to do. I mean, you know, I could I could have gotten really, you know, chesty and said I'm the master of the markets now and but I had known better because, you know, prior to that for two years, I pretty much quit every day <laughs> because it's hard, man. This is not easy. No, it's not easy. And actually, we have Ray Trundy in here. I think you know Ray quite well. Yes. Um, How you doing, yeah. Ray? Yeah, he's there. There we go. He, he's the one who asked stuff about the mindset. There we go. How do you work on your mindset? What do you do to build your mindset? <laughs> so that's a pretty good question. Well, one of my dad's. Uh, wisdoms is uh, preparation lowers stress. If you're not prepared, you're certainly going to get into your mindset, and your mindset is 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 uh, you know you're you're going to be just making decisions willy nilly. I think mindset is always do your homework. Preparation, you, you know, one of the biggest. We were just talking about this in a in a meeting I was in where discipline starts the, the day before you, when you do your homework from the previous day, then you get up and you do your homework for the, for the current day and you put together your hypotheses and you look at everything and you say, okay, the, the, you know, this is one of the things that I see happening today. And, and then to be able to recognize that hypothesis as coming true and then to be able to trade a strategy to that hypothesis, it's all, in the preparation and there's no guarantee that any trade is, is ever going to be right 
or wrong or how much it's going to make or or you but you can decide how much you're going to lose yeah i always say to people just like the weather you can't control the weather you can't control how long the move is going to last and how far it's going to go so you need to focus on what you can control. Like you said, your stop loss, maybe timing your entry, exactly what you want to see around a particular level. So rather than chasing constantly like a headless chicken, have an orientation point in mind, uh, have some hypothesis if that level gets defended or, or if it gets broken. So have both sides and then look mm -hmm. for clues. You know, what I, I'm really quite baffled that people think our job is about predicting the markets. Yeah, sure, we work within a probabilistic environment and it is an environment of uncertainty, right? But at the end of the day, we're not psychic. We're just playing probabilities. And the way I do it, I usually have orientation points and I have um, hypotheses for both sides. So if the, that level causes a reversal, that's what I want to see. If the level doesn't cause a reversal and it's completely ignored by the market participants, well, then you just go with it. You're not just going to stick to the bias and just go, I'm just going to go short here no matter what happens. <laughs> that's the most dangerous yeah. thing you can do. That is, that is for sure. Yeah. So when it comes to your mindset, um, was it something that you started being aware of really early on or, or was it something that came later? Well, um, mindset's always a challenge. It's after 30 years as an active trader, it's still, can I, can I give a plug? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got uh, group coaching today at 1230 and the author of The Mental Game of Trading, Jared Tendler, is going to be there to answer, answer your questions um and so know, he is the mindset guy by the way if, if you guys don't know he's written like about three books and it's all about the mindset psychology how to work with yourself rather than against yourself really good stuff yeah. it's about sports it's about gambling and now he's got this book about trading and I'm, i never met him i'm really looking forward to it but uh when i got hired as a proprietary trader there were a couple of guys there that were that were you know meant to, uh, uh, mental game guys, right? Uh, they actually wrote a book called The Inner Game of Trading, where they interviewed, you know, wealthy pit traders about their mindset and how they became as successful there, which was a, which is another good book. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a constant work, you know, um, even after 30 years, if I have a bad streak, I feel really bad about myself about, and you can't do that. I mean, you're, you you don't have any 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 um, reason to to feel bad about yourself. It's just the market. It's just a couple of losses. Um, so these... yeah, I mean, it would be great if uh, some people are like, oh, isn't it boring if we just made money every day? Well, no, it wouldn't be boring. It's just something that people say because that would be you know it would be easier, wouldn't it? But the reality <laughs> is losses. Yeah, so losses are a part of what we do. So we have to learn to let go, and we have to be okay oh, with it. And sometimes, if you're not okay with it, the best thing you can do is just accept that you're not okay with it and right. sleep it off. I guess. Well, you know, there was. There was, you know, there's core reasons for the things that that cause us to make consistent mistakes. We we, we make mistakes. We still make mistakes. There's yeah. there's a trade that you're going to probably take tomorrow, and you're going to go, oh, why did I do that? That never works, and I still did it anyway. I did you're it yesterday. <laughs> I literally did it yesterday. <laughs> I've, right. I've had I've had a super hot streak. Like I've really had like three months just totally smashing it. And I'm very aware that at some point after such a good streak, I will get a, a losing streak, obviously. Now, yesterday, I had something wrong with one of my dogs, so I had to uh, give my attention to him. And I came back towards the end of the market. It was like two or three hours left. So I'm like, right, I'm going to do my, what I call the day range fill strategy on crude oil. And I was looking for the weakness in crude oil, as I normally do. Um, and then that Russia thing happened, and it totally threw me off my game. I wasn't in the game uh, to begin with because I wasn't there for most of the day. I wasn't looking at the charts. I wasn't really going with the flow. You were, you were probably still with the dog, too, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so anything that's happening in your private life that might be a bit disruptive to you, it can totally throw you off. So people need to stay aware, stay aware of that, and then work with it. And if if you just can't get yourself to get a good trade in a couple of attempts, well, it's either that you're not seeing things right, or it's the market doing something odd. 
So you need to walk away because there are abnormal days like yesterday, right? How many times in, in our lifetime did uh, stray Russian missiles hit a couple of Polish citizens and kill them? Right, it's like, right, you know? right. And that's the stuff right. that we cannot control. So I gave it a couple of tries and I realized I just wasn't reading market. I'm like, okay, being a Muppet today, uh, like one of my traders says, Muppet meter, three or five, walk away. <laughs> well, you know, through experience that um, when we start doing those things to stop, you know, a lot of folks, they do make a couple of mistakes and they double down and they start to, and they lose their strategy and they get away from their process just because they've got to make that money back. You, you know, we know not to do that. We know to walk away, or at least we hope we do most of the time. But uh, one of the things I used to do after a long winning streak, if I started getting nervous about breaking the winning streak, I broke it. I broke it on my own. I would take a day off. I know. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I one time I had a really good day, and uh, and then and it was like all in like one one trade, and it was like kind of my beginnings with Top Step. I think I made like just over like three grand or something. And you just said, uh, "Yeah, whenever this happens to me, it's great, but I just like to go to the woods." <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was such a good advice. So I do that now. I've actually practiced that all of these years. Whenever I have a super good streak, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to actually take a break and enjoy myself for a while. And it yeah. works. It absolutely works to kind of realign you back to where you are. Um, and, yeah. and to kind of normalize the the windfalls that we go through without any kind of extra dopamine rush and addictive uh, personality disorders, right? Yeah, we're all addicted to dopamine. Yeah, I mean, as humans, of course we are. Like, you eat a piece of chocolate, it hits your dopamine center, right? So it's not just trading, it's everything. But yeah, as long as you're aware of it, then it should be fine. Um, so so how did you personally deal with that transition from pit trading to electronic trading? Because I know that many people were not successful uh, going into electronic trading, and a lot of people kind of fell off the, the face of the earth, sort of, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Well, I had the benefit of seeing a lot of those people move from pit to screen and their lack of success. So I knew that there was a considerable a considerable amount of work that I was going to have to have to do. Um, so I just kind of worked at forgetting everything that I was going to be able to see by benefiting in, in the trading pit to only what I was going to be able to see on screen. And I traded on Sim for a year. Um, wow. Trying to get my head wrapped around how I was going to be able to operate with this. Um, and start slow. You know, I uh, just started trading one. Uh, you know, found uh, a lot of solace in the, in the, in the profiles. And... I had never heard of Delta before. Um, you know, I'd always known of open interest, but never really looked at it that much. Um, and reread Mind Over Markets, Markets and Profile a bunch of times. Um, I basically keep them as reference on my desk. Um, uh, and, you know, I was, I was, um, uh, Four four fifths of the way getting hired by the compliance department at the Mercantile Exchange when Top Step came up. Mm-hmm. You know, I was you know, I was going to probably g- give up trading, but I had already done all that work and I was reasonably pro- profitable enough to maintain the account, which you know to me is that's the first step of, of finding profitability. You got to be able to maintain the account before you're going to be able to profit. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and again, a very, very good point, guys. Uh, so uh, whoever's watching this, if you're going through a prop ch- challenge and you're going, oh, I'm just going to uh, make money, make money, make money. No, once you get funded, the first real goal is to just keep the account. It's not to make profits and it's not going to be forever. But that first period of getting funded and then messing it up, that's where 90 percent of traders trip up because they're not mm-hmm. aware that they're going to have that drop off in performance. So as long as you can, like actually one of the guys says it really well, if you, if you can make that period as cheap as possible, that's your best, best way of dealing with, with that initial sort of car crash moment, 
so to speak, because mm-hmm. you will not be trading that well at first. Nobody does that right right away, especially not not oh. if it's your like first funded account. Yeah. So as Did long as people are aware, yeah. yeah. So main, maintaining the account was your first uh, first step. Okay. First, I, first thing, you know what? Let's just maintain the account. Try and build it over time. If I can build it over time, then I'm on to something. Then I can mm-hmm. start to. You know, so how eventually. did you meet Michael Patak? How did you guys meet? Was it on the floor? Uh, well, he was at the he was at the board of trade. I was at the Merck. At the right. time, I was a filling broker in the S and P pit, and there was one of my one of my customers who had a he had a phone man. His name was Brian. Brian was roommates with Michael Patak. Brian started telling me about this idea that they were working on. Um, while we were still at the, at the Merck and, you know, Brian and I got along, he thought I was funny, thought I would, you know, fit the squawk radio that we did. Remember you know, the squawk radio? I remember that I was, I was on it. Yes. <laughs> right. right? And, uh, so, you know, we, then the Merck buys the board of trade, they combine the, uh, the trading floors. And that's when I first really met Michael and, and Eddie, even though Eddie was at the Merck for a little while, I didn't know him then. So I just kept kind of hanging around and, you know, seeing what was going on. I loved the idea because I knew that, you know, eventually the floors were going to be gone and that there, were, there was going to be no, like, education for people that are interested in getting into trading because you weren't going to get that job as a runner. You mm-hmm. work your way up on the trading floor. You were going to have to do it and, God forbid, risk your own cash to do it. So that's one of the things that I do love about Top Step is, you still get that little feeling of skin in the game, but you're not risking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars yeah, to try and that's right. out of- to fund yourself. And that inevitably runs out for a lot of people. Like there's only right. so much money you can throw into into your own live trading before you realize that actually scalability is a huge problem for many people. Of course, if yeah. you're somebody who's like well capitalized and you have like 250k to just throw away. Go for it. Like that's the only time I would say, yeah, you don't need a prop firm. But let's face it, most people are not there, right? I've talked to many people who have done just that. They have taken hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and just six months later, it's gone. Yeah, but this is why I said so that you can throw it away. I said it on purpose, not to trade with, because I guarantee you, on the first attempt, most people will not be able to make money. (laughs) So that's just a start, right? Just burn. Throw it out out the window. <laughs> so one of our guys wants to know, if I become a top step funded trader, am I entitled to top step swag? That sweater looks cozy. <laughs> ah, well, this is old branding. We don't have these anymore, but uh, it doesn't entitle you to any free swag as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, because I think you've got, to, you've got to shop, don't you? From yeah. what I remember, because Michael sent me something one time. And it, it was a lot of stuff. I actually got a few few tops that branding. Uh, I have a, a little pouch that I use for my dog walking. So I like I go around with top step, <laughs> fanny pack nice. basically. Yeah, and I think I have uh, I have a rain uh, kind of like a rain hoodie, which is great in the summer because it's really light. So yeah, they do have some really nice stuff up there. Definitely worth checking they out. They have a T-shirt with my face on it. Ooh, no, I'd buy that. Ooh. Because, you know, you, you've got quite a face. <laughs> yeah, it, was, uh, it was in the, the Chicago Sun-Times. It's, uh, I don't look very happy in it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says you look like one of the cricket players over here. He's got, especially when you were younger, you had like the, the really thick, dark uh, mustache. And there's a guy that looks exactly like you. And uh, and when I showed him the photo of you, I said, hey, this is my risk manager. It was like years ago. And he said, oh, he looks like that picketer. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I've got to keep an eye on time because I know you've got uh, the Jared's coaching session. You're doing about, what, 40 minutes or so? Okay. Yep. So uh, we've, got, uh, we've got some some time left so let's do let's do one more question and maybe take a couple of questions from these guys and then we'll let you go uh, so okay. i know that you work uh with top step as a risk manager you work with, as a coach we all know you from there you're our our rock our beacon of light whenever we get a bit lost you're, you're too kind <laughs> so now you're very good uh, at coaching it kind of it's almost like a natural ability did you do that like before you started with top step did you ever coach any junior traders around you well um i did a lot of 
Well, I was a baseball coach for my son's travel baseball team. Ah, right? That's where that comes from. And, you know, I was the announcer for their, for their uh, peewee football league, you know, so, and uh, I did a lot of, a lot of kind of coaching with, with youths and uh, I don't know where the, the, the uh, assumed ability to to help people and coach people came from. It. Oh no, you definitely have that ability because I I knew about profile because I went for an apprenticeship. I was actually in Chicago, and they kind of taught us the basics of profile. But it wasn't really until I got to Top Step and we kind of started chatting, and you were doing um, like for a presentation for like everybody. Um, now you're probably able to reach a lot more people. But back then, I think it was only like a few of us in the room and it was all funded traders. And I remember that some of your ideas about timings and, you know, when is uh, is the setup valid and where when it isn't valid, it really kind of pushed my own understanding of what I'm looking at. You were the first one to tell me about looking at the strength of the auction through single prints and whether they're being left behind or not and whether the, the single prints are being chewed up and all that. It, it helped me so much to hone in uh, to some concept that I kind of instinctively knew that they were there, but it just help me quantify them. So I want to thank you for that because you've been like a huge influence, positive influence on my trading. Um, now, Ray actually wants to know, because I know you know Ray, the wildebeest. Yep. <laughs> he wants to know what's more important to you, price or location? So price or location? Well, I would say value over, over location is more important than price. Price is just the advertising mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, looking at where how value is moving over time, I think is more important to location. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just go through these as well. As to, um, yeah. So some people are asking uh, where uh, the coaching session is. It's going to be on the Top Step channel with uh, with Jared yeah. Tindler. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Channel. Top Step yeah. YouTube channel. Yeah, so Top Step YouTube channel. Um, I think you guys already had some people send in uh, some coaching questions. Are you going to be taking questions during the, the actual stream as well? We're going to do our best to get through as many questions as we can. We do have a, you know, a few that were emailed in. Those will be first. Um, and we've got a couple of people that are going to be kind of vetting the questions. Like, you know, we're not going to ask Jared what platform he's using. Um, hmm. So, you know, in 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 um in context questions we're going to try and get through all of them okay yeah so there you go because I've, as i'm looking through the chat there's been quite a few questions about how you trade what do you consider your most important indicator like a whole bunch of coaching questions so uh that's something that uh, you guys might might want to go to top step channel and then ask the ask the hogue to uh to maybe elaborate and you'll have jared there as well you know all with, right uh, with with group coaching, I mean, we do it every Monday and Wednesday at uh, 12.30. Um, co go to the Top Step site, find coaching, find group coaching, sign up, and you'll have a lot more time one-on-one, -on -one, sort of, with me to, to ask to answer those yeah, questions. So, yeah, <laughs> so the, that's the thing that I want to say. Uh, whenever, I don't know how many of you went to one of the coaching sessions, but I'm quite familiar with them. And actually, you, you're going to see me there, John, as well. So I'm going to be in there. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it's it's quite quite a huge value that uh, any trader who's taking part in those coaching sessions can can have, uh, because your question, yes, it might not be uh, taken that day, but if if it's a smaller uh, smaller coaching session, Hogue will answer your question, and it's almost like getting your one to one with with John. It's like, well, what else do you want? It's amazing, right? You get to have somebody who has so much experience answering again, your questions <laughs> again you're, you're too kind nobody knows everything and i'm in that class but yeah. uh you know, what I do know we're going to talk about and what i don't know we're going to learn together yeah um so one last question and then i'm going to let you go um gustavo says he's looking for books on trading psychology any suggestions uh the mental game of trading Mental game of trading. Okay. Yeah, is that Jared, Jared Tindler? Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I'm no, going to write that down. 
the Steenbarger book, um, you know, the Daily Trading Coach, the Daily Trading Coach 2.0, uh, uh, one that I found to be extremely helpful, which probably is a lot of where I got some of my coaching from is, um, what is it, Improving Trader, uh, Enhancing Trader Performance, which is also Steenbarger. Okay. Um, I'm also a big fan of, uh, of course, Dr. Meneker, who's got, um, who's been, who spent a little bit of time with us uh, in the past. And um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mark Douglas books, uh, The Discipline Trader. Of course. And oh, Trader. I love, I love Mark Douglas. Absolutely love that man. <laughs> Great books. Yeah. Yep. All right. So um, that's all the time we've got. I want to let you kind of have a little bit of a breather before your next uh, coaching session. <laughs> uh, so, for our, yeah, so for our viewers, uh, you might want to mosey over to the Top Step channel where John is going to be doing the coaching session with uh, Jared Tindler. So like we said, he's another trading coach, trading educator. Uh, so John, thank you so much for this interview. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Dee. Thanks for inviting me and uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, likewise. And thank you to our viewers for being here with us. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your week.